All right, that looks like that's working. Just take care of a couple other little things. And we are going to get down to work. Um, I, I hope you can tell that we're doing Pesach, Passover, uh, and we're doing part one. Uh, that's because Pesach is a uh, incredibly important holiday and one that has a great deal going on. Um, and we're going to have to take two different uh, sessions to go through it all. And even then, as always, we are just scratching the surface. Uh, it is impossible to learn everything you need to know about any Jewish topic in an hour, uh, even in two hours. Uh, it takes a full lifetime, but at the very minimum, a little extra personal uh, research and study. But tonight we begin Pesach, and that means we need to ask, why? Why are we doing Pesach? I don't mean like, why are we studying it today? But I mean, why is Pesach even a thing? Why is Passover even a holiday? And to answer that, we go where we must go, back to the Torah, uh, back to the book of Exodus, chapter 12. Speak to the whole community of Israel and say that on the 10th of this month, each of them shall take a lamb to a family, a lamb to a household. You shall keep watch over it until the 14th day of this month, and all the assembled congregation of the Israelites shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they are to eat it. So this is, of course, taking place during the sequence of plagues, the, uh, the different uh, calamities that befell the Egyptians because of their continued refusal to allow us to leave. Uh, and this is a, in preparation for the final, the 10th plague, uh, the slaying of the firstborn. And this um, blood on the doorposts would be a sign that the household was a Jewish one uh, and thus should not uh, succumb to the, the problems that were about to befall the nation. They shall eat the flesh, meaning the, uh, the flesh of that uh, lamb, that same night. They shall eat it roasted over fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. So already you can begin to see the, uh, the formulation uh, of the different commandments the eating of that uh, lamb, the sacrifice, the eating of unleavened bread, what we call matzah, uh, and the eating of bitter herbs. Uh, we'll talk about those in more detail uh, next week, but uh, we will, uh, of course, touch on them a little bit more tonight. For those of you that are unfamiliar, matzah is, uh, the basic definition of matzah is flour and water that has been mixed together, but not allowed to rise, not allowed to leaven, uh, but baked before that can take, take place. And as for bitter herbs, well, that is a bitter plant, uh, and we will talk about that in more detail. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in any way with water, but roast it, head, legs, and entrails over the fire. That is the, the sheep. You shall not leave any of it over until morning. If any of it is left until morning, you shall burn it. This is how you shall eat it, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurt hurriedly. It is a Passover offering to the Lord. So this concept of Passover, of Pesach, is uh, very much commemorating this moment of anticipation for our liberation, this moment of, uh, of eating from the, the sacrifice we have made and eating the matzah, the bitter herbs, uh, the maror, in, in expectation that at any moment we could be finally freed from Egypt and out that door and away from this land of slavery. That is the ultimate reason why we are continuing to celebrate this, uh, this, this holiday, uh, is because we all should continue to rekindle that feeling of, of anticipation, of expectation, and of hope that freedom should be just outside that door. And even though we are obviously much more free than uh, we have been pretty much at any point in human history, that does not mean that uh, we are completely free, nor does it mean that everyone is free. And uh, until all are free, uh, we continue to, uh, to hope and to work for the liberation of everyone. Now, the Torah goes on in chapter 13 to tell us, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a festival of the Lord. So in addition to the holiday at the beginning, of Passover, we also have holiday days at the end, and in between we are eating only matzah, if we are eating bread. Throughout the seven days, unleavened bread shall be eaten. No leavened bread shall be found with, with you, and no leaven shall be found in all your territory. 
and you shall explain to your son that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I went free from Egypt. And this shall serve you as a sign on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead, in order that the teaching of the Lord may be in your mouth, that with a mighty hand the Lord freed you from Egypt. You shall keep this institution as a set at its set time from year to year. So even though, of course, after the first generation would pass away, the ones who had lived through the Exodus, even though that would happen, we are still to retell our children that Passover is celebrated because we have experienced freedom thanks to God. Yes, we may not have actually lived in Egypt, thankfully, but I still feel as though I were in Egypt and would have been continually enslaved if God had not had the momentous event of the Exodus to bring us out. And that is something that has to be commemorated, has to be marked, and has to be personalized so that it is my own experience, not merely a, uh, a historical experience that is uh, muttered and learned uh, only occasionally. In order to experience that, there are four holiday mitzvot. There are four commandments that go along with Passover. The first that we heard about first was the Korban Pesach, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, the eating of, of its meat having been cooked and prepared properly. If you'd like to learn more details of that, I'll refer you to my Mishnah uh, class on uh, Psachim, where we go into much more detail. As you can notice, it is uh, struck through on this page. Uh, that's because we no longer can perform this mitzvah. Without the altar of Jerusalem, uh, without the temple that stood, we cannot uh, commemorate Passover with the official Passover sacrifice. As such, uh, we can still learn about it, we can still recall it, uh, and we can still even uh, commemorate it in our own way by having a festive meal, but we do not have the actual Passover sacrifice. In many Ashkenazic communities, that means that they will not eat anything that is lamb-based at all for fear that it might appear as though they were eating from a Passover sacrifice that had been inappropriately offered. Uh, in many other communities, Mizrahi and Sephardi, there are different customs regarding the um, uh, acceptability of lamb on the table. Um, personally, I know that in the United States, it's just hard to find kosher lamb, um, but uh, that is up to you and your own uh, family traditions. Number two, the Passover ritual meal, the Seder. The Seder, meaning the order of the, the service of that retelling, is perhaps the most famous aspect of the Passover ritual. It is a, a huge meal that is orchestrated around the retelling of the Exodus, uh, and we will talk about that in great detail today. We will also talk about two elements of that Seder, which are the eating of matzah and maror, the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. The removal of chametz, the getting rid of the leavening, and how that works, what counts, and uh, how we go about doing it, that is something we will cover next week. So let's get down to the Seder. This is the, the guidebook. This is the, uh, the Haggadah, as it's called. Uh, that we read during the Seder. Now, I say read, but unlike reading the Torah, where we simply begin with a verse and work our way through it, trying to understand it as best we can, the, the Haggadah is not meant to be read just page one through page whatever yours finishes on. The Haggadah is a, uh, a roadmap. It is a, a, a skeleton. It is not a script. It is designed to provoke additional reflection and conversation. It is designed to create room for questions and discussion. It is not meant to merely be recited. Uh, and that is incredibly important. And if you learn nothing else from our discussion this afternoon, learn that, that as you go through the Seder, it is not enough to simply say every word on the page. In fact, those words have changed as I'll demonstrate uh, later today. Uh, over the centuries precisely because they are meant to reflect the, 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 the needs and the, uh, the feelings of each generation and in order to make sure that the exodus would always feel personal and that we would reflect on it as individuals, not as mere reciters of some ancient book. But we also need to follow a guide. We still have a Haggadah, 
because no matter how personal it should be, we want to make sure that we do not lose sight of the communal and of what is shared. And we also want to make sure that we do not forget any of the important elements, either of the mitzvah or of the concepts behind our retelling that are essential for the, the development and growth of our faith and our spiritual lives. So as personal as it is, we still need the guidebook of the Haggadah. It works together. As always in Judaism, the individual and the community, the present and the past are not opposites. They are um, co they, they cooperate in order to provide us with a fuller life. And as an order, there is a list. Uh, that is to say, there are bullet points that lay out exactly what we do and the order that we should do it. We're going to go through each of these, but I just want to make sure that you can see the, the broad outline of each section. Um, we don't need to go over them on this page because we will go over each piece in its, uh, in its own um, time. But I'll leave it up here for those of you that are on uh, YouTube and can hit pause. And then let's go in, look at each one directly. So the first is what is first in most of our holiday celebrations, the Kadesh or the Kiddush, as it sometimes is also referred to. We sanctify the day with this blessing, and it is a blessing that is said over wine, uh, and it's said in a way that celebrates the unique aspect and theme of that particular holiday, uh, while also celebrating in general the gift of the holidays that God has given us. Now, the thing that is unique about the Passover um, dinner, uh, the Passover Seder, is that we are not going to only drink one cup. Uh, we're not only going to have one moment of uh, jubilation, but instead we will end up drinking four cups. Now, these four cups of wine are very, very important, um, but it's important to understand that as important as they are, they don't have to be big. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people will uh, go to great lengths to have beautiful and large cups for their Passover Seder. And that means that by the time they've reached cup number two or three, they may not be able to continue the, uh, the celebration in good shape. And some of them will then skip the remainder of the Seder. It is far better to drink less for each of the uh, initial cups or to, uh, to mix the wine with water in order to dilute the alcohol content. Now, why are we drinking four cups? Well, because of four specific promises that God made to us in Exodus 6. Specifically, excuse me, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian. As you can see, there are four verbs here that are um, sort of delineating the promise that God is making for removing us from Egypt. And as we will see later when we talk about the, the beautiful poem, Dayenu, uh, had God only done one or two or three of these, it would have been enough for us to recognize the miracle uh, of God's presence and God's deliverance. But as all four occurred, all the more so they each must be uh, celebrated and rejoiced. And thus we have four cups of wine to make sure that we are not uh, overlooking the many different layers, the levels of uh, help that God gave to us. So let's begin with the, uh, the first part of our meal, which is Urchatz and Karpas. Now Urchatz literally is the washing of our hands. And this washing, unlike the later one we will have, is done purely for the basic, basic hygiene. Uh, this is a washing of your hands because you probably were coming in from your work, your, your life, uh, perhaps even having gone to Jerusalem for the sacrifice, and you need to wash your hands. Unlike the later washing, which is done for ritual purity, this is done for just basic cleanliness. And as such, this is done uh, without a blessing. We are not fulfilling a mitzvah here. We are just taking good care of ourselves. And of course, in the light of the, uh, the epidemic that we are hopefully seeing the tail end of just now, uh, we have to uh, be thankful that our ancestors have reminded us that 
washing our hands is a very good thing. This is followed up by our first eating of the evening uh, of Karpas. And Karpas is eating from some form of the uh, earthy uh, vegetable type produce. It is very common in, uh, in America and most European communities to use parsley, to use that bright green first symbol of, uh, of spring shooting out. But technically, any vegetable on which we would say bere pariha adama, uh, the blessing for fruit from the earth, fruit, of course, meaning produce, uh, would be sufficient. Uh, some use potatoes, some use other things. And it is customary to dip it in salt water uh, as both flavoring, but also as a reminder of the sweat and tears of our ancestors in their slavery. Now, this is not intended to replace the main meal. In fact, this is intended precisely to make you hungry. When we get to the main meal and we are eating our matzah, which is not considered the most appetizing of food for many people, having already whetted our appetite this early in the evening and then delayed our, our meal means that by the time we get to the matzah, we are ready to eat. Um, as, as many people will often joke, the most important question on the Passover night is when do we eat? And they are kind of right, but the answer is not as soon as possible. The answer is wait for it. And when you eat, it will be all the sweeter when you get to it. Having eaten the karpas, we now perform yachatz. And yachatz is the breaking of the matzah. Now we break the middle matzah um, because in the Ashkenazic world, uh, of which America is, um, has a majority of Jews, uh, we have three matzahs. And we break that middle matzah and we set aside a portion of that as an afikomen, which we'll talk about later, uh, which will form the, the, the dessert for our meal. Uh, and yes, matzah is both the first thing we eat and the last thing we eat on Passover night. Uh, as a little bit of a historical aside, uh, you may be wondering why we have three matzahs at all. Well, because it was customary, just like on Shabbat or any other holiday, to have only two loaves, that is to say, two sheets of matzah, and to break the bottom one, that would then be set aside as the afikoman. However, as that would leave you with only one and a half loaves of matzah, which seems a deficient or insufficient uh, celebration of the holiday, it later became custom in the Ashkenazic world to add an additional full loaf, full sheet, um, which would then serve as the second full loaf. So we end up with uh, three loaves to start and 2.5 by the time we get to our meal, and then the second half after the meal. And then we begin the portion of the service, uh, of the Seder, of the Haggadah that takes up the most time, what's called the Magi. And as the Mishnah itself describes, they pour him a second cup, number two, and here the child asks the parent, and according to the child's understanding, the parent teaches, beginning with shame and concluding with praise, interpreting from, excuse me, Aramio Vedovi Avi, my father was a wandering Aramean, until he finishes the entire passage. We're going to look at that passage in just a bit, but I want you to understand the basic framework that the rabbis are giving to us here. You'll notice that they are saying a second cup, and then the kids ask, and you teach, and you use this general text uh, as your springboard for explanation. But you should tailor the explanation according to the needs of the people around the table. Um, from children to the elderly, we find out as well. There is not a full Haggadah found within the uh, Mishnah. There is not a full Haggadah found within the Talmud. The, the Haggadah that we have today has been added, added to and edited by multiple generations, each taking this core framework, which is based in turn on what we learn from the Torah itself, to provide us with the necessary components that will enrich and uh, in. Uh, enhance our, our telling of the story and of our spiritual experience. But the fact that we have added so much does not mean that we should feel uh, trapped in a straitjacket to the text, but should instead see it as being a, a treasure chest full of ideas and full of different teachings as a, a great uh, repository from which to draw 
uh, when we are trying to experience the Seder ourselves and when we are trying to explain it to others. So don't, uh, don't let that make you a prisoner, let it, uh, well, set you free. And what do we start with? We start with the down and then we rise up. And in the shortest version, it comes in this early paragraph. This is the bread of affliction, this, this matzah, that our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is in need, let him come and, and conduct the Seder of Passover. This year we are here, next year in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves, next year we will be free people. In just a couple sentences, we have a, a beautiful synopsis of the Passover experience. It was to remind ourselves of the, the terrible state we began in and to end with a personalized feeling of uh, being also in a bad position, but with hope for where we are headed, that we are going to relive that experience of liberation through the Seder, through the Haggadah, and that we do not have to do it alone, that we know what suffering is and we welcome the uh, participation of any else, anyone else to come and join in with us through that journey. And that's the, the invitation that is made to all that are hungry and all that are in need. Now, the Mishnah talked about asking uh, or answering the questions of a child, but sometimes you need to uh, prompt the child to begin asking questions. Sometimes kids don't know it's okay to ask questions. Uh, after all, if you're in the middle of a Torah reading, uh, you don't always, you wouldn't expect a child to uh, leap up in the back of the sanctuary and begin shouting questions. The Seder is different. For this, we want them to ask questions. And so we prime the pump. We give them some uh, basic questions or things to notice that will make them curious and make them uh, ask the questions that are on their mind. And the most famous section of this is the four questions, uh, which you'll notice is actually one question with four parts, uh, or rather four examples of the differences, um, which focus on what is happening that is so different this night. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat both chametz and matzah. Chametz is the normal bread, matzah being the unleavened. On this night, we eat only matzah. On all other nights, we eat many vegetables. On this night, maror. On all other nights, we do not dip vegetables even once. On this night, we dip twice. We've already dipped once with the, uh, the parsley and the salt water. On all other nights, we eat sitting and others reclining. On this night, we are all reclining. Now, these are four things that are done differently. Precisely so, we will be asked these questions. Yes, of course, we have to eat matzah, that is a mitzvah. And yes, we eat maror, but we are doing so in such a unique way that it is designed to provoke those questions. However, those four questions are not the original four questions. And in fact, there is no original four questions because we have from uh, the, the Mishnah in Pesachim again, a different set of questions that might be asked. As it says, and here the son asks his father, but if the son has not got the intelligence to do so, the father teaches him. How different is this night from all other nights? You'll notice immediately that contrary to the custom in the modern uh, Jewish world, we do not force the youngest to ask these questions, which can often be a little bit of a tongue twister when done in Hebrew. But instead, these are four questions that are done as a prompting um, so that even a young child who does not yet have the, uh, the intellectual capacity will begin to notice the differences and ask questions. For on all the nights, we eat chametz and matzah, but this night all of the bread is matzah, very much the same. For on all the nights, we eat diverse vegetables, but on this night, only bitter herbs. And number three is going to sound very different. For on all of the nights, we eat meat, which is roasted, stewed, or boiled, but this night, all of the meat is roasted. We didn't talk about that. Uh, and number four, for on all of the nights, we dip our foods one time, but on this night, two times. We said we didn't dip at all. That's because the eating practices of the ancient world often had dipping, but the Seder night would have double dipping, unlike us, which don't have a lot of dipping in the Ashkenazic communities, and thus uh, we have changed how we express ourselves. And question number three, of course, is reminding us that in the land of the Mishnah, 
they still had the sacrifices, at least in the earliest um, times of the Mishnah. And thus they would have been noticing that the sacrifice was cooked differently than was cooked on other nights. So that would prompt their, their request. And reclining was, yes, done, but it wasn't offered as an example in this text of a question that should be used to prompt the children. And then, of course, you answer it, not by reading some carbon copy, if anybody even knows what carbon copies are anymore, not by e reading some uh, recitation from Wikipedia, but instead by adjusting the explanation to the needs of the given child. And if we look in the Rishalmi, the, the Jerusalem Talmud, we'll notice that they didn't even have four questions, they only had three questions, uh, ones which we have already seen examples of. And you, you'll notice that they also didn't dip at all, uh, and so that was how they explained it in their communities. Now, when we get to uh, that point, we have to then uh, remind ourselves that we're not only doing this for the children. As it says in the Haggadah, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord our God took us out from there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, which is the perfect example to, to give to even the, the youngest child. If the Holy One, blessed be he, had not taken our fathers out of Egypt, then we, our children, and our children's children would have remained enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt. Again, a very personalized, very powerful way of looking at the Exodus, and one that would be useful for teaching children. However, even if all of us were wise, all of us understanding, all of us knowing the Torah, we would still be obligated to discuss the Exodus from Egypt. And everyone who discusses the Exodus from Egypt at length is praiseworthy. This is again reminding us that Passover is not only a children's holiday, it is not something that should only be understood at a child's level, but that even when we have mastered the basics or even advanced level of understanding, there is more to learn, more to discuss, and more to continue to experience, that we will always be able to, to learn more from the uh, amazing story that is unfolding. Indeed, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria said, I am like a 70-year-old man, and I have not succeeded in understanding, meaning even he still had new things to learn, even at 70 and even as one of the great rabbis. And we get into then the question of, well, how do we tailor this for different people? And this leads us to what is one of the more famous portions of the Haggadah, the, the parable of four sons or four children. Blessed be God who has given the Torah to his people, Israel, Blessed be he. The Torah speaks of four sons, a wise one, a wicked one, a simple one, and one who is not able to ask a question. How do we handle these four different ones? Well, and how do we even know that there are four different questions? Well, when you look in the Torah, the Torah mentions four different times about teaching your children. And it will come to pass when your children will say to you, what is the meaning of this service, this avodah, this work to you? And you shall say, it is a Passover offering to God. Also, and you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of this that the Lord did for me when I left Egypt. Again, you can see here there was no question. This is just an answer given to the one who couldn't ask. Part three, it shall be when your son asks you on the morrow saying, meaning in the future, what is this? And you shall say to him with a strong hand, the Lord took us out of Egypt. Again, we now had three different ways of trying to answer this question. And number four, when your son asks you in the morrow saying, what are the testimonies, the statutes, and the laws that the Lord our God has commanded you? And you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and God took us out of Egypt with an outstretched arm. So these are four different uh, templates that are found in the Torah, thus corresponding to four perhaps different ways of asking the question. Now, what is, oops, sorry, went too fast. What is interesting is that the breakdown of which child is asking which question, meaning which one was the wise question, which one was the wicked question, and which answer should give to each, is something that has changed in different editions of the Haggadah uh, over the last 2,000 years. So it's not always the wise one who asks about the testimonies and statutes. It's not always the wicked one who asks what is the meaning. And that means that the answer has to be given carefully to each of them in order that we are hearing from the individual, that we are not trying to use a cookie cutter answer because our children and our adults are not 
cookies, uh, cookie cutter people. Now, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the text that we are using as our basic springboard for the entire discussion of the uh, Haggadah uh, was from Deuteronomy 26, verses 5 through 10. Now, that is only, as you can tell, five verses, well, six verses technically. And that means that it is, um, well, short. But on the left-hand side of this chart, you will see the actual text taken from Deuteronomy. And on the right-hand side of the chart, you can see the interpretation that is used as an example from the Haggadah of how we might explain the different parts or words of the actual uh, text found in the Hebrew. So the text in the Hebrew reads, my father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there with a few people and becoming a great nation, powerful, oh, come on, powerful and numerous. The Egyptians suspected us of evil and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt. With a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great awe, with signs and wonders. Now, oh, sorry, didn't mean to click one more time. So that column on the left is all you technically need to say. But as we just heard, the more we can expand upon it and reflect upon it, the more we will uh, unpack and uncover the, the deep emotional, spiritual, psychological, historical, um, political, social truths that are found throughout all of this. On the right-hand side are the, the sample explanations that are found in the rabbinic telling that is part of the Haggadah. Does that mean that we just read my father was a wandering Aramean and he went down to Egypt, compelled divine, by divine decree and sojourned there. He did not come down to settle in Egypt, but only to, does that mean we just read it like that, flat, monotone, without thought, without care, but just if we say it, we've done it? No. First of all, you should always be reading the Haggadah before the Seder, not only on the Seder, so that you had chance to think about it in advance, that, how you'll find your own questions and maybe even a few new answers. But even more importantly, if you only read what's here and add nothing from your own heart and from your own mind, then you are failing in your duty to truly tell and understand the story. And that is a shame um, because, like I said, there is so much to be gleaned. Now, we're not going to go through all of these uh, lines here this evening because, well, it is lengthy. That's why it takes the most time within the Seder itself. But hopefully you can always come back and hit pause and have a chance to read them. Uh, or find them in any full uh, Haggadah that you might happen to own. And there are many different editions of the Haggadahs out there. And use that as a chance uh, to, uh, to begin to, to learn and delve a little bit more deeply. But after having told that basic short paragraph with explanation version of the Exodus, we then also will retell the, the, the themes of the Exodus uh, in a little bit more detail, focusing on different aspects. Like I said at the very beginning, the Haggadah is designed to tell the story in a way that will appeal and reach different people that are around that table, wherever they might be in the world and in whatever century they might live. That means the Haggadah will take a couple swings at bat. It's not only going to use one technique to get the message across. So for example, in this point, we uh, reflect upon the plagues themselves that were uh, levied against the Egyptians for their refusal to allow us to go. Uh, a reminder, of course, that they had a chance to let us go after each and every one to give them a chance to, to do the right thing. And that we recognize that these plagues were miracles, and yet the miracles that came afterwards, meaning our um, uh, miraculous um, deliverance at the sea, and then onward into our, our continued existence and support uh, under God uh, are even greater miracles, as Rabbi Yossi the, the Galilean uh, points out at the text at the bottom. I'm checking the time, and I want to make sure that we can get everything done. Um, but this then leads us to uh, another part of the retelling called Dayenu. And the idea behind Dayenu is that 
we are thankful to God for what God has done, but we are thankful for each element of what God had, has done. For example, had he brought us out of Egypt and not executed judgment against the Egyptians, it would have been enough. Dayenu means literally it would uh, enough for us. Had he executed judgments against the Egyptians and not their gods, it would have been enough. Had he executed judgments against their gods and not put to death their firstborn, it would have been enough, Dayenu. That we are recognizing that we should be grateful for each element of the Exodus, not only for the cumulative effect. That if only we had experienced one aspect, it would have been enough for us to have created a holiday and celebrated each year. But all the more so from having experienced all of them, should we continue to celebrate and give praise. But we're not done in the retelling of the retelling of the retelling. We've done it already once in our answer to the, uh, to the children. We've done it already once in the, uh, the telling of the wandering Aramean. We've done it already once through the Dayenu. And now we're going to do it again uh, through the, uh, the symbols that are found on the Seder table. Rabban Gamliel used to say, anyone who has not discussed these three things on Passover has not fulfilled his duty. Namely, Pesach, meaning the Passover offering, the actual um, sacrifice that would have been on the table uh, back in the day. Matzah, meaning the unleavened bread, the matzah that was uh, commanded while we were still in Egypt and which also sustained us when we first left. And the maror, the bitter herbs, um, which remind us, of course, of the bitterness of our slavery. Having talked about these three, uh, these three symbols, we have fulfilled at least the minimum of our duty. And in the Haggadah, uh, each one, whoop, in the Haggadah, each one of these three uh, is given a short paragraph to help us reflect on what it represents and, and what it means for us in our current uh, day and situation. And as it goes on to say, in every generation, it is man's duty to regard himself as though he personally had come out of Egypt. As it is written, you shall tell your son on that day, this is on account of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It was not only our fathers whom the Holy One redeemed from slavery, we too were redeemed with them. As it is written, he took us out from there so that he might take us to the land which he had sworn to our fathers. With that um, final um, celebration and restatement again of the whole theme of the Exodus, we then break into song uh, in uh, the first two Psalms of what we call Hallel. Those are Psalms 113 and 114. And then we celebrate with our second cup of wine. Remember, we poured it at the beginning of our story, and now we are drinking it as we get to the end of our retelling, which should tell you that we are moving to the next section of the service. And that section is Rakhtsa. Rakhtsa is where we are going to wash our hands again, but this time we are going to use the normal Netilat Yadayim um, process, the, uh, the normal double-handed cup that we use to wash our hands in order to create a state of ritual purity, and which we do anytime we are about to eat uh, from our bread. We follow that up, of course, having now prepared ourselves with motzi and the blessing for eating matzah. We say the motzi just like we would over any bread that we are about to eat, thanking God for lechem, for bread, because matzah is a type of bread, just very, very unleavened. And we say the blessing for matzah itself. We have to thank God for the mitzvah of al achilat matzah, that we are been commanded to eat matzah, for as we saw in the book of Exodus, that is indeed a perpetual commandment. Having said that, we get to eat the matzah. We don't get to have the main dinner yet, but we finally get that matzah in our mouth. Remember, we had our little bit of parsley and salt water at this point, perhaps a couple hours ago, maybe a bit less, depending upon the telling of your Seder and depending upon the, uh, the people around it, especially if there are young children, it might be slightly accelerated. But finally, we have that matzah and how amazing it tastes as, um, as thin, as uh, dull, as perhaps even flavorless as the matzah might be, depending upon the brand that you've uh, purchased from. After that long retelling, it is the most beautiful thing to finally taste. And that is exactly the point, that even though when we left Egypt, 
the whole world in front of us was still a great uh, difficult uh, challenge. Nonetheless, being able to eat it in freedom with all of its difficulties was sweeter than anything we had ever had while we were yet captives in Egypt. Because Egypt was bitter. Thus, we eat maror, the bitter herbs. Now, the bitter herbs are going to be eaten when we dip them in haroset. Haroset is a special mixture that is made uh, from many different recipes, but usually it has uh, apples and wine, uh, and it's usually mixed also with cinnamon. Some people will include dates or uh, almonds or other types of, uh, of nuts like walnuts. Uh, some people will include figs. It, it all depends upon the, the different recipes that were common in different Jewish communities around the world. And we dip the maror, this bitter herb, in the haroset so that that bitterness is not too much, that the bitterness is not um, debilitating. As much as we want to, to rekindle and taste the bitterness that our ancestors felt as slaves, we want to make sure that we also temper it. Uh, this is that tension that goes throughout the entire Haggadah and Passover night, that we are reliving the suffering, but we are also rejoicing in our current um, degrees of freedom. Uh, and that is a really exemplified in this taking of our bitter herb, our dipping it in haroset, and then eating it with uh, the bracha. Now, what is maror? What is the bitter herb? Well, as you can see here from uh, the Mishnah again, that these yirakot, these plants, uh, are the ones available for a person to fulfill his or her obligation on Pesach. Um, and there's not really much point in reading out the names, because as you can see at the bottom, there are many different interpretations of what most of these might be. So what does that mean for uh, the modern person? Well, in the modern day, uh, I would suggest trying to find a good, bitter romaine lettuce, usually right near the base of the leaf is the most bitter part of the lettuce. Uh, often uh, you can find uh, dandelions or endives, sometimes um, rocket uh, as, a, as a bitter type of herb. But what you want to avoid are spicy plants. Uh, and yes, I have to talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, many people are accustomed in the Ashkenazic world to using horseradish for their maror. By most measures, horseradish is not sufficient nor appropriate to be used as a bitter herb. It, uh, for one, it is not the leaf and the vegetable, it is the root, which again is not allowed according to the Mishnah and Jewish law. Uh, it is also usually pickled uh, or cooked in other ways when prepared, uh, and that really would disqualify it. But most importantly, it isn't bitter. It is spicy, it is hot. Uh, and just like we couldn't fulfill maror with a jalapeno, we can't really fulfill maror with, um, with horseradish. Uh, and that was, I think, very deliberate. Our ancestors were, first of all, not looking to cause pain when we ate the bitter herb. They were looking to cause bitterness. And secondly, emotionally, it is often easier to withstand the pain uh, that goes along with a terrible suffering situation than it is to withstand the bitterness that seeps into our lives. And, and that is a lesson that I think the, the, the Haggadah is really trying to get across to us, that it's, uh, it's very easy to, um, to tough it out when you're just being hurt. But when you're made to feel bitter, then that is when hope disappears. That is when your strength disappears. And so tasting just this little hint of bitterness for just a fraction of a moment, and even that is um, helped by the haroset, is trying to remind us of how bad bitterness can feel uh, for a person. And, and again, that bitterness is something that is fundamentally different than the experience of the pain that might come from eating too much or too hot of horseradish. If you want horseradish at your Seder, that's perfectly fine. I like it with my gefilte fish, which is a lovely traditional food, but make sure you're actually getting a plant that is bitter for your maror. Uh, looking at our time, yeah, I think we've got just a little bit about 
uh, this that we can talk about. Just a little bit more on this concept of the bitter herbs uh, taken from the Talmud. So again, they're arguing about what counts as a maror, as a bitter herb. Others say it is any bitter herb that contains sap and the leaves of which wither, meaning any leaf as long as it's bitter and it's a proper plant. Ravina came across Rav Aha Bar uh, Abba, Bar Rabba, and Se, uh, who was out in search of dandelion. He said to him, what are you thinking? That is more, that it's more bitter? But we have learned in the Mishnah as the first item on the rule lettuce, that chatzeret. So you might think that the worst bitterness would be the one you should go for. And that's not true. Indeed, anything that is even moderately bitter would be perfectly fine. Now, in the modern world, I will point out that most lettuces, uh, even romaine, is not very bitter. Uh, it has been uh, grown again and again and again to try and get rid of that bitterness. Um, so certainly if you are not finding any uh, lettuce that is uh, bitter enough, then by all means use dandelion, rocket, uh, endives, or some other leaf that will give you the proper bitter flavor. But you don't have to make yourself sick. You don't have to um, gag on something that is horribly bitter. Said Rav Yuhumi to Abaya, on what basis do we know that the reference to bitter means an herb? Maybe it's gallbladder of a shibuta fish, right? What do you think could be bitter? There are lots of non-plant things that are bitter. It must be comparable to unleavened bread. Just as unleavened bread is made from what grows in the earth, so this bitter must be something that grows in the earth because the commandment to eat both of them was given simultaneously. Well then, why not say it is a shrub with bitter leaves like oleander? It must be comparable to unleavened bread. Just as unleavened bread is a species of plant, so this bitter must be a species of plant and not a tree. In Jewish law, we make a difference, a uh, distinction between things that grow always and things that grow for one year, get picked and then grow next year. So a bush or a tree is something that is always there and that would not be sufficient. Um, and also don't eat oleanders. Um, but uh, that is why we use something that is uh, grown uh, just seasonally rather than perennially. Why not say, since the plural is written, it must be one of two varieties. It must be comparable again to unleavened bread, just as unleavened bread may derive from many species so the bitter here may derive from many species. So technically matzah, as we'll talk about more next week, can be made from, uh, from wheat, from barley, from oats, from rye and spelt. Um, so too, there are many different options for what could make the bitter herbs. And having now eaten our matzah, having eaten our bitter herbs dipped in haroset, we now make korech, which is a reminder of the sacrifice. We take the, the matzah, we take the maror, we put them together, and we realize something is missing. There should be a third thing, and that third thing being the meat of the sacrifice. But of course, without the temple, we cannot have that sacrifice, and that means we do not have meat. And so we eat our reduced um, reminder uh, at that point. And then, Shulchan Aruch, we eat our main meal. Uh, the matzah and the bitter herbs are not meant to be all we eat. We are not uh, trying to suffer, uh, but they are the introduction to the meal. And enjoy. There are many different great Passover recipes and cookbooks out there. And I am not the one to tell you how to cook them, except for the kosher side, uh, because I'm not the world's greatest cook. I'm, I can manage, but I am definitely not a super cook. When we finish our meal, we come back to the afikomen. See, you forgot about it. As I mentioned, that middle half of the matzah that was hidden away is now the final thing we eat. It is our dessert, and it is the final flavor in our mouth apart from the third and fourth cup of wine. Uh, and there are many different customs around the afikomen. Uh, some families will hide it uh, and let the children find it. Others will have the children try to steal it and kidnap it, and then they ransom it back for some sort of prize or treat. Um, but ultimately, this is our final food for the, the end of the Passover uh, Seder. I'm uh, sorry, the end of the Passover meal. The Seder is not done yet. Um, we continue, of course, with Birkat Hamazon, here called Barech, which is our blessing after our meal. And we have a third cup of wine 
that we use for the uh, focal point of this after blessing. When that blessing is done, uh, we then move on to Hallel. And Hallel contains many addition. Uh, after we do Hallel, we also do many additional songs. Uh, there have been a numerous um, selections taken from our traditional uh, prayers, as well as um, new songs written just in honor of Passover. And all of them should be enjoyed and, uh, and celebrated to your heart's content. And then finally, with Nirza, we come to our fourth cup of wine. And we pour a fifth cup of wine. <clears throat> On Exodus 6, 8, the next verse after our four, ver our four um, verb verses, we see, I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession, I the Lord. This is a fifth promise. And there is a debate in the, uh, in the rabbinic world of whether this fifth promise is also part of our celebration of Passover, or whether it is a celebration for entering the land of Egypt, uh, sorry, the land of Israel, a little too late for my brain tonight. Um, and so we are unsure, should we make another blessing over that fifth promise, or should we not? And so we pour a fifth cup, but we don't actually drink from the fifth cup. It is ready and waiting. In the moment of beautiful dramatic anticipation among many that we have throughout the entire evening we pour that fifth cup recognizing that that final promise is not finally answered and in fact we'll have to wait until the end of days until eliyahu hanavi elijah the prophet arrives and elijah answers this and many other questions for us in anticipation of the mashiach of the messiah coming and so it is customary to uh, call this fifth cup elijah's cup to open up a door and to uh, to wait for Elijah to enter and to answer these and all of our other questions. And it is a, a remarkable way of transitioning from our celebration of how we went from slavery to our current life and from our current life looking forward to our anticipation of a better life for us and for everyone. Like everything else about the Haggadah and the entire Seder, it is beautifully choreographed to move us emotionally and spiritually through so many different steps and, and stages. Uh, and that leaves us then with this feeling of anticipation, even as we feel full from our celebration and everything that we, has led us up to this point in our service that night. And with that, we finish. The Seder is done. There are many other customs, many other details. Obviously, you need a full Haggadah to lead you through it. But does anyone have any questions for tonight that aren't about keeping kosher or the other parts of Passover? Because we're going to handle that next week. Uh, yes, Marilyn. Okay. Um, one of the things that I probably missed, but maybe need repeating, is the difference between Chazeret and Maror. So on many Seder plates, there'll be places for, for both of them as a kind of um, backup. Um, but Hatzeret in the, um, in the official uh, language of the Mishnah was a bitter type of lettuce that was the maror. But over time, um, there became <laughs> discussion about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as such... Um, that debate and discussion led to some Seder plates adding an extra spot for that, that lettucey piece in addition to whatever was used locally for maror, um, which of course was very important if you were in a place where the local maror was horseradish, which was done by necessity um, because oftentimes you couldn't find a proper bitter herb in those, uh, in those regions of, uh, of Eastern Europe. But it is not, it's not strictly needed to be a separate, uh, separate item. So, so it's really an extraneous item. Well, technically the horseradish is the extraneous. Right. And the chatzeret should be the maror, which would mean you wouldn't need okay. a separate spot for chatzeret. So it's just tradition or Ashkenazic tradition that has put the bitter herbs of, of, of um, 
maror on the plate. Uh, they put the bitter herbs with horseradish as bean maror. As the, right, on exactly. the plate. Exactly. That, that, that is a, an Ashkenazic tradition. Um, but technically, the maror spot should be taken by some I leafy. Clear it. Uh, exactly, by some leafy product. Okay. And you never mentioned the egg. Ah, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> so the, the egg is a, a fascinating addition to the Seder plate. Um, it is often referred to as a, a symbol of spring, a symbol of the, the rebirth of hope. Uh, and all of those symbols are, are beautiful and great, and please take them to heart. Um, but the most convincing explanation that, uh, that I have heard is that the, the egg that was added to the plate was done so for the same reason that we added to our plates in the ancient world. Um, you see, the, the Passover offering, the actual meat of the fast Passover offering, would be divided among all the members of the household, and usually among multiple households that had all go, gone in as a uh, sort of co-op on buying the lamb. Um, and that would mean that the average person at the house might only get a little bit of meat. And that was kind of insufficient, uh, you know, because you did want to eat and be full, not only eat and having fulfilled only the bare mitzvah. So people would uh, have additional food that was specially made for the uh, special meat that was specially uh, slaughtered for the, the holiday. And that additional food is represented by that egg um, as being a sign of additional fullness that, um, that we have more. But in different times of our history, it wasn't always possible to have more meat. And certainly we weren't having little pieces of lamb because we didn't have the Passover sacrifice at all. And so for many communities, it became customary to use the egg uh, as a, uh, a stand-in for, for that food, as it was a, a more common and readily accessible uh, embellishment. So when did the Passover plate become part of the Seder? Uh, relatively recently. Um, depending upon the community, some uh, different times over the last three, 400 years, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, people would, of course, arrange the, the different parts of the Passover offering in dishes on the table, um, but they didn't necessarily have a dedicated pre piece of, of crockery uh, or metal that was the Passover plate. That developed over the centuries in different communities, um, uh, much as the same way that a, a menorah for, for Hanukkah, what we would call a Hanukkiah, is a relatively modern invention as well. Uh, originally, people just put up multiple lamps or one long oil trough with multiple wicks uh, for their Hanukkiah. But over time, people wanted to invest the time and resources into making dedicated ritual items for, for different holidays. Thank you. But, uh, but technically, yes, if you just had uh, a number of small plates that you wanted to put your harosid on and you put on your, uh, your maror and put down your egg and your, your parsley and all of that, that would be perfectly fine. It doesn't need to be a, a dedicated single plate. Um, additionally, of course, having a dedicated plate, especially one with labels, made it easy for many people to remember the minimum that was needed um, so that they would not leave anything out, which, as I said at the very beginning, was one of the big points of having a Seder, of having an ordered list mm. for our entire celebration, um, because as uh, individualistic as this can and should get, we also don't want to miss anything that really needs to be mentioned and, and uh, experienced. Understood. Hmm. There's, um, you know, wonderful uh, museums that have Jewish um, items from different centuries. And it is fascinating watching the development of some of these ritual items over the, uh, the different centuries as, as people continue to, to put their, their passion and their artistic and, uh, and depending upon the century, their, their material wealth uh, behind these, uh, these amazing uh, items that reflect so much of the internal spiritual and emotional life of our people. Yes, I think we need some of those. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We have uh, our, our special Seder plate is one that we received as a gift uh, from our wedding. 
And, uh, you know, every year when I get it out and unpack it from its, because uh, it's um, uh, porcelain, uh, unpack it from all of its little um, bubble wrap components and everything, it's, uh, it's a special moment uh, every year. I know I could just put out a glass plate and slop everything on it in its own little um, spot, but um, doing it the other way definitely feels, feels good. I will point out when I was in Japan and did not have my own special Seder plate, that was what I did, was I just had a plate and I put the pieces of the different Seder on the plate as I could. But it is, uh, it's nice having something dedicated. Yes. Just like, you know, Friday night candles. Uh, you could technically yes. just stick them to a plate with a bit of wax, but it's, it's nice to have something put aside. Uh, it helps with the kavana, with the focus and the intention mm. for the deed. Yes. Which, by the way, reminds me, Temple Israel has a wonderful gift shop. If you are lacking anything in any of these uh, departments, please stop by sometime. Just uh, call the office first to make sure it can be uh, opened up for you. And uh, I say that a little tongue in cheek, but really it is uh, wonderful to go and pick it out in person as opposed to just buying something online. Am I premature in asking about the third Seder? Uh, no. Well, what would you like to know? Are you leading it? Uh, yes, I will be leading it. Uh, we are doing it, as you mentioned, as a, a third night Seder, um, the uh, second night of Seder, it, which is our traditional community Seder at Temple Israel, which we haven't had for two years because of COVID, uh, is going to be Saturday night. And there are a great many difficulties of preparing food for perhaps 100 people uh, on Shabbat. Mainly you can't, uh, which would mean we would have to start the Seder very, very late. And so we are going to be doing a Seder-like meal uh, and service on the third night, uh, which will be Sunday night uh, for this year. Uh, but yes, I will be the, uh, the person leading it. Good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If you have more questions about that, please contact the office and they can uh, set you up with all the RSVP information and all of those good details at which they, are, which they excel. Yes. All right. Well, good night to everyone tonight. As always, if you have questions, keep them coming uh, either in person, through email, text, phone, whatever you need. I know there can be a lot of questions around Patreon. Just keep them asking. As you can see, it is part of the